Welcome to chapter nine, ethics and moral decision making. This is uh, one of my favorites. Uh, there's a lot of hotly debatable topics in this uh, chapter. Um, and so I'm looking forward to jumping into this one. So here's a really good question to start everything is, is you have to figure out what motivates some people to, to give their time away and their money and their resources to help other people while the vast majority don't engage in this type of activity because we know that if they did, there'd be a lot fewer problems in the world. There's very few people who spend a significant amount of their time or money volunteering um, to help other people. So the question is what motivates this man to do it and maybe not others? Where does that motivation come from? So moral and ethic reasoning, um, ethical reasoning. Perhaps in no other area are people so prone to engage in rhetoric and resistance as in debates over controversial moral issues. Things that don't have a right or wrong answer necessarily, and they tap into people's morality because people's morality are deeply held beliefs that they do not like to departure from. Skills and critical thinking can help us evaluate moral issues from multiple perspectives, as well as break through patterns of resistance and confirmation bias, which we often engage in when it comes to moral issues. We engage in moral reasoning when we make a decision about what we ought or ought not to do, or about what is most reasonable or just a position or policy regarding to a particular issue. Effective moral reasoning making uh, depends on critical thinking skills, familiarity with the uh, basic moral values and motivating force of moral sediments. So morality. So Aristotle taught us that morality is the most fundamental expression of our rational nature and that we are happy in it, happiest when we live moral lives and we put our morality above non-moral values. So this idea has been around for a long, long time. The association of morality with happiness and a sense of well-being is found in moral philosophies throughout the world. And studies support this claim that moral values are those that benefit yourself and others. And they're worthwhile for their own sake. They include things like altruism, compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, and justice. And we're engaged in those values. This is when we're happy. So if you go and you think about your happiest moments, I want you to try to try to think, that, did it involve compassion? Did it involve maybe tolerance or forgiveness or justice? And these are in sharp contrast to non-moral values. And non-moral values, they're a means to an end. There are things like independence, prestige, fame, popularity, wealth. And we live in a culture and a society that hold up these non-moral values as being what we should all strive towards. We should all strive to be independent and be popular and wealthy. And although many people regard non-moral values such as career success, financial prosperity, materialism as a means to happiness, there is very little correlation or connection between prosperity and happiness, except at the very lowest income levels. This basically means if you have enough money to eat, you have a, you have a roof over your head, you have a place to sleep and you have those basic needs met, very little material wealth beyond that increases your happiness in any significant way. Yet, things like compassion, altruism, tolerance, forgiveness, and justice, they do increase your happiness. Yet we spend so much time chasing these things that will bring us very little happiness. The case of Phineas Gage. I'm gonna go over a video with that. Um, 
so I'm not going to get into depth about it, but it is a wild, wild story. So a moral strategy, when we fail to take appropriate moral action or make a decision that we regret later, we commit what is called a moral tragedy. A well-developed conscience provides us with the knowledge about what is right or wrong. And like language, whose basic structure is innate, our conscience is nurtured, neglected, and shaped by our family, our religion, and our culture. Conscious, consciousness has an affective or emotional element that motivates us to act on the knowledge of what is right or what is wrong, right? Like if we're in a situation and something doesn't feel right, that is often our conscious speaking to us. An effective moral reasoning involves listening to the effective side of our consciousness, as well as the cognitive reasoning side. So you're going to balance this idea of emotion and what your values are with sound reasoning. And when you combine those two things, this is when you're in a position to make an effective decision. So moral sediments are emotions that alert us of moral situations and motivate us to do right or wrong. They include things like a help or high, emotion, sympathy, compassion, moral outrage, resentment, and guilt. These emotions often motivate us to act. So a help or high, I'm sure most of you have experienced this, it's that rush of endorphins after you have spent some time helping someone, volunteering, spending some time in the community, making it better. After you have this experience, often it follows by a period of relaxation and improved self-esteem. You feel good about yourself. Compassion is, is empathy in action and involves taking steps to relieve others' unhappiness. So no wonder these things make you happy, right? Moral outrage, also known as moral indignation, occurs when we witness an injustice or a violation of moral decency. Moral, moral outrage motivates us to correct an unjust situation through demands for justice. Resentment is a type of moral outrage, and it occurs when we uh, involve when we think other people or ourselves are treated unjustly. And guilt both alerts us and motivates us to correct a wrong that we have committed. So here's a good example of moral outrage. Uh, it was the it was the case where uh, Rosa Parks um, was sitting in the bus, and everyone knows this story. Um, and a white person, my man, I think, came in and wanted her to give up her seat, and she refused um, because she felt morally that was incorrect, and she was going to stand up for that. And what they did was in Montgomery, they boycotted the buses, and any any all these people. Instead of riding the bus to work every day, they walked. And they did this for over a year. And the buses ran empty for over a year. And um, the result was finally the municipality gave in. And um, the idea of you needed to sit in certain seats because you were a certain color uh, went away. Guilt and shame. Guilt is often broadly defined to include shame. However, they're different. Guilt results when we commit a moral wrong or violate a moral principle, and shame, on the other hand, occurs as a result of a violation of a social norm or not living up to someone else's expectations. As good critical thinkers, we must learn to distinguish between the guilt and shame. Okay, Lawrence Kohlberg, he was the uh, psychologist that came up with the three levels of um, proficiency in critical thinking. And so <clears throat> the three levels are pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. And you'll see this um, come up again and again. So the pre-conventional stage of uh, critical thinking or reasoning, moral reasoning, is you can see the diagram on the left-hand side. You filter everything kind of through yourself when you're making decisions. And I say this is like a two-year-old. So if you've ever been around a two-year-old, it's all about them. It's about when they're hungry or thirsty or tired or bored. And they think very little of others. And then what happens is as we grow older, we move into this conventional stage. And this conventional stage is a stage in which we put other people's opinions ahead of ours. 
we look up to our teachers and our parents and our broader society to really govern what we think, how we feel, and what decisions we make. And then eventually, some of us, not every, not everyone, get to a post-conventional stage. And in that post-conventional stage, you hold your opinions and values equal to those of others. So uh, in the pre-conventional stage of moral development, um, morality is defined egotistically in the terms of self. And this is what I explained briefly in the other side. Uh, other slide is that most people put themselves in the center and others are the very small circle. And most people outgrow this by the time they get to high school. They realize that maybe the world is not all about themselves. Um, and then they get to the conventional stage. And people at this stage, they conform to peer groups and they believe what other people believe. And you can see this just by looking at how people dress in groups, right? A lot of people that are hanging around each other at a certain age dress the same. And that's just a show, uh, you know, a visual symbol of the group conformity. They also think the same way. And then by substituting wider norms or laws of their peer group, culture, a process known as cultural relativism, people move to the second stage of conventional. So eventually what they do is they substitute their peer group to the wider culture and they begin to believe what people in their culture believe. You know, it's not crazy. They, they believe what is right and what is wrong based on their surroundings. And most adults remain at this conventional stage. Most adults never get to the third stage. They never get to the point where they see outside of their culture that there's other ways to live and perhaps the way they're living their life or the way their family and friends are living their life may not be the only way to live. Maybe there are other values out there. It's a very interesting idea. So in the post-conventional stage of development, people recognize that social conventions need to be justified. Moral decisions should be based on universal moral principles as opposed to the principles that they grew up with. And they should be concerned about justice and compassion and moral respect. Unfortunately, less than 10% of adults ever get to this post-conventional stage. This is uh, a highly controversial topic. I, I, I debated even uh, about including it. More reasoning in women. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time um, going through this, especially if you, you look in big font at the bottom. It says research has reached the consensus on Jillian's claims that there's um, or there's no consensus that that there are, there's a difference in moral reasoning between men and women. Um, what, what's interesting about this, a lot of this is cultural, right? Like where you grew up and how you grew up and the expectations of women, the expectations of men. But universally, those things change. And what that tells us is that there's very little evidence that, there, that men and women are different in terms of how they approach moral reasoning or what they kind of inherit innately when it comes to their moral compass. So moral theories provide frameworks for understanding and explaining what it makes uh, a certain action right or wrong. They also help us clarify, critically analyze, and rank moral concerns raised by moral issues. In, in some ways, they help us evaluate moral issues by applying a framework to the issue and, in very simplistic terms, creating almost like a pros and cons list. So there's two types of moral theory, moral relativists. They claim that people create morality and that there's no universal <clears throat> morality or shared moral purpose or principle. And so what that means is that really uh, it depends on where you grow up, that morality changes if you grew up in India versus growing up in Canada or Japan or Ethiopia. And then on the other hand, moral universalists believe that there are universal moral principles. No matter where you go in the world, murder is wrong. And that is not because of where you grew up. It is because we all as human beings 
have a universal moral compass that tells us that taking someone else's life is not right. But there's a debate. Some people feel like it all depends on where you grew up and what culture you grew up in. And others believe that uh, it's universal. Wherever you go in the world, this is how people behave and what they believe. So according to ethical subjectivists, morality is nothing more than a personal opinion or feeling. And that really, everyone has their own morality and it is, it is, it is very subjective. Cultural relativism is the second form of moral relativism and it looks at public opinion or customs to really dictate what is right and what is wrong. Here's a good example. In this example, um, they're, they're openly trading human beings at a market, right? It'd be like the Berries Farmer's Market that happens in the summers. You go there and maybe you get tomatoes and some fresh bread and uh, a person, right? The people would be for sale. And it is ridiculous to say that, but it wasn't long ago that in certain cultures, this was completely acceptable. So based on the culture and the time, your opinion of what is right and wrong changes. And then this is a lot more recent in history that people would, and you can see people smiling in this picture, they would, they would go to public lynchings where they would, where they would hang minorities from trees and take pictures of themselves. Because in this culture, this was completely acceptable. It's unbelievable. Morality is universal. Most moral philosophers believe that morality is universal. The following slides examine four different universal theories, utilitarianism, denatology, and virtue ethics. So utilitarianism, is a theory in which actions are evaluated based on their consequences. And whatever creates the most happiness and the most principle of utility are the ones that are the best moral decisions. And utilitarian calculus was used as a means to determine which actions are or principles are morally Preferable. So which way to go? Almost like using a calculator and saying, okay, these principles serve if we make this decision. These principles are served if we don't make that decision. And they come out with a number at the end and they say, okay, we should make this decision because the numbers told us to. And they base it on all of these factors. So what they do is they look at intensity, duration, certainty. They look at uh, how soon the pleasure will come. They look at the extent of the pleasure. They look at... Um, does it cause any pain? They look at the number of people it'll affect and they take all of these factors into account. They calculate them all up and then they make a decision on what is morally the right decision. Denatology is different. It claims that duty is the foundation of morality and that some acts are morally obligated regardless of the consequences. And a good example here um, is the golden rule or the principle of reciprocity that exists in every major religion, right? If you go out and you do something, it's always your duty to do on to others as they would do on to you, right? That is your duty. Maybe as a soldier, it's your duty to commit murder in another country because you're, what you're doing is you're protecting a higher moral value, maybe your country or your family. So Immanuel Kant devised the categorical imperative that states that act only on the maxim by which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law, right? So it should be universally applicable, your moral and ethical decisions. You should be able to apply it to every situation. And here again is the golden rule, right? Something we probably could applied every situation. Here's a representation of every religion in which it exists um, and how important it is to do unto others as they would do unto you. So here are the seven duties, uh, the prima facie duties. First ones are forward-looking duties, duties based on past obligations, ongoing duties, 
<clears throat> morality is universal, and this is right-based ethics. So in right-based ethics, moral rights are not identified to legal rights, as they are often cultural relativism. Yeah, so for example, when we had the segregation in our country and other countries, that was a cultural law, or that was, a, that was cultural relativism, right, at its peak. But universally, it was going against treating others as you'd want to be treated. So in that situation, the moral thing to do would be to treat others as they would like to be treated, and that everyone should have the right to pursue their interests without interference from others. And that those interests, as long as those interests don't harm or violate other people, right? Moral rights are generally divided into two categories. We have welfare rights and we have liberty rights. And welfare rights is our right to entail <clears throat> to receive uh, certain goods, such as education, police, fire protection, that we have a basic right to these welfare things, like in Canada, right? Like, this is a very entrenched idea here in Canada, that everyone should have access to an education and health care and police and fire protection. And then liberty rights uh, is the right to be left alone and pursue your own interests as long as you aren't hurting anybody else. Freedom of religion and speech, uh, the freedom to choose what career path you want, the freedom to privacy, all of those things are your liberal rights. Yeah, welfare rights is the right to include emergency medical care. So virtue ethics emphasize character over the right decision. A virtue is an adm admirable characteristic trait or disposition to habitually act in a manner that benefits, that benefits oneself and others. So we talked with this at the very beginning of this lecture, compassion, courage, generosity, loyalty, honesty are all examples of virtues. Virtue ethics go hand in hand with universal moral theories. They believe that these virtues are universal and that you should abide by them. And being virtuous entails cultivating moral sensitivity. And moral sensitivity is an awareness of how your actions impact other people. So moral theories provide a foundation for moral arguments and their application to real life situations. In making moral arguments, the point is not to prove that you are morally superior to others, but to come to the conclusion that leads to the action or policy that is reasonable and consistent with your moral values. In evaluating moral arguments, it is the first step to make sure that an argument is complete and that no important premises are deleted or omitted. Moral dilemmas are conflicts uh, between two moral values, and these are the most difficult ones. And solutions to moral values, it's not right or wrong. It's only what is better or what is worse. And ideally, the best resolution to a moral issue or moral dilemma is the one that honors as many moral values as possible. When evaluating and resolving moral dilemmas, you should use the following steps. One, two, three, four, five. So go through these five steps when evaluating moral dilemmas. And in conclusion, uh, being able to recognize moral arguments and develop uh, skills to evaluate moral reasoning are important factors in critical thinking. And there is a positive correlation between the level of moral reasoning and critical thinking ability. So if you are a better, better critical thinker, you will have an easier time in your life uh, going through the moral issues and the ups and downs. So that was uh, an overview of chapter nine. Um, there's a lot in there. I do encourage you to take some time, read through your textbook, um, go into depth a bit more into these theories and definitions so you can ensure you have a great understanding. And once you have done that, take the time to do the quiz um, to really get a sense of what you understand. Hopefully you found that useful. As always, any questions, please reach out.